I'm Ian Tate, I am the curator of the Shetland Museum and we're sitting here in the Shetland Croft House Museum and it's more than just a house, it's a house and a barn and a byre and there's a water mill as well and the background to this place is quite interesting. Uh, houses like this and outbuildings like this, there used to be thousands of them all through Shetland and for many many centuries because the the lives of the Shetlanders, once upon a time, was very much self-sufficient. People grew their own crops, they had their own livestock, they made their own furniture, their own farm tools, their own garments, uh, their own boats, caught their own fish. Uh, so as you can understand, it was very much a subsistence way of life in the genuine meaning of the term. And part of that, of course, was their, their home. and. Uh, the homes of the animals and uh, the buildings that supported all the workshop activities they needed to do. The design of buildings elsewhere in Shetland have all or had all the main elements that this one does, which is a house and a barn and a byre all in a conjoint block. And that was done for a reason. It meant that in all weathers people could travel between the house and the outbuildings. It's easy for us today to forget that it wasn't simple to go outdoors with light in November in a gale. Now you switch on the electric torch and you're there, but in those days it's a candle lantern or it's a, a lamp uh, burning seal oil or fish oil and it's a very imperfect process trying to take light outdoors. So for that reason as well as also we're all used to having all weather survival suit type clothing not so in the 19th century and centuries before that so it was far more sensible to have your outbuildings connected onto the house and you could go through to tend to the cattle because the cattle were kept indoors every night and they were in the byre for most of the day in winter uh, and also you're having to prepare meal uh, uh, prepared grain, so that's all happening in the barn as well, so you're all in a few footsteps of the house. Um, but in the other parts of Shetland, uh, such as the West Mainland, but of course in other parts too, it could be Central Mainland, North Isles, North Mainland, other parts of Shetland too, um, the layout of the oldest style houses was such that you went from outdoors into the byre, then into the house, then into the barn. So the the house was very much sheltered from the elements and that extremely old style of building did still survive in some instances in Shetland in the 1960s. And as I say there was hundreds, thousands of these buildings all spread through the islands and things tended to not change very much over the centuries because of the nature of subsistence. Shetland is only ever going to have the natural resources and the capability to support the things it can in certain limited parameters. In the 18th and 19th century, most of the things in a traditional Shetland house, certainly up to the earlier 19th century, were items that the islanders had made themselves, and they used themselves, of course. Um, but one of the earliest inroads that um, imported goods made in Shetland was from the Netherlands. Although Shetland was part of Britain, of course, we didn't really see too many trading links with Britain until 
really quite well through the 18th century, but ever since the beginning of the 17th century we'd had very strong links with the Dutch because of their herring fleet, and the herring fleet came here every year for about 300 years. Thousands of men came every year and they came ashore and they came to houses like this and they'd buy uh, milk, chickens, uh, hats and socks, and they'd get fresh water for the boat and uh, a lot of the goods was bought in coinage. Most of the coinage used in Shetland was Dutch coinage through the 18th century but another favourite thing with the Shetlanders for the Dutch were these. Now, what they contained when they came was what the Dutch called Geneva, and Geneva was a type of gin, and uh, there's contraband gin, or would be regarded as contraband today, of course, because they didn't pay any customs due. That was very popular with the Dutch, but also as popular with the Shetlanders too, so much so that, interestingly enough, um, the the flasks that the, the gin came in, the Geneva came in, it had a Shetland name, but the Shetland name didn't derive from English and it didn't derive from our own Scandinavian language either, it derived from Dutch. Um, we called it a crook and the Dutch call it a kruk. And these are Dutch kruk flagons for Geneva and every Shetland home had these. This item here has self-sufficiency written all over it. Uh, today, of course, we're used to fast food and uh, it doesn't take too much of a leap of imagination to imagine an era in which every single thing that was eaten had to be uh, made yourself from products that you had grown yourself or reared yourself. But there's a whole other uh, trip for the mind again to think about actually having to make the utensils yourself. Uh, what are you going to eat with? Uh, well, in this case, this is an uh, item used to make a culinary utensil which in itself has had to be handmade. So this really does have uh, subsistence written all over it. What you're looking at here is a thing called a clam. And a clam was a, a clamp used to make spoons. And you can see that this two-piece oak vice here, it's got a groove and a concave piece there and another flat area there with a convex bit there. And the spoon itself was made for a piece of coo's horn. There is one. And uh, the horn was, was boiled to soften it and uh, cut open to flatten it out. And then when it was still soft and it was cut to the shape and it was placed into this clam here and then that was closed. And this one isn't a for this particular clam, it doesn't close totally. And um, an iron ring was hammered on the end there and when the thing cooled it would retain its shape. And it would retain its shape permanently unless it was dropped into boiling water and then it could lose its shape again. But if providing you still had the original clam you'd be able to get it to drive together back into shape again. And you can see this particular one has been adapted to fit a different spoon because that's a piece of leather in there that they've changed the shape of the bowl. So that's a handmade thing to make a handmade thing in order for you to eat your eat your uh, your ready break or your, uh, your rice krispies. <laughs> this item here I'm holding on to is called a skull. We're all used to table settings wherein everybody gets an individual plate and maybe a side plate and a pudding plate and a, and a mug or if you're being a bit posh maybe a cup and a saucer. But in the kind of house that this is for centuries any notions of refinement like that would have been pretty laughable. Uh, they might have been an aspirational idea towards that but it was a thing that only the gentry did because of course you need to have disposable income in order to be able to buy ceramic plates and things like that. So what people had done for many centuries and still was clinging on in the early, even the middle of the 19th century was eating out of a thing like this. Now the way it was operated was that um, the food was served up communally. Uh, generally speaking what would happen is that the, 
the, the fish, if it was fish they were having, would be in the middle of the skull. And the tatties were arranged around the side. And Hussus long ago in Shetland, they didn't have a table, because a table was a, generally a, a bit of a, a waste of space, and literally a waste of space, because it was taken up a lot of room, it used to be a flat surface on it. And the space in your old-fashioned Shetland house was generally taken up by uh, chests, chairs, beds, um, presses, so things to store things in, things to sit on, uh, and things to store things in that you could sit on. So what they did for a table, generally speaking, when it was food time, was that um, they'd pull uh, all the chairs around for however many people was needing to eat, men, women, bairns, old and young, uh, and then an item of furniture could be a chest or it could be a chair. Set down like that, uh, with a skull on top, and the fish and tatties were all arranged about. Everybody positioning themselves around about the skull, and the cutlery. There's the cutlery, your fingers, and people just took it like that. And uh, the washing up must have been the easiest task in the world. One dish, and soak your own fingers clean, and that's it. And uh, the name itself in Shetland Skull means, um, I suppose, like a, like a big oblong box. So the word could also be used for, say for example, um, a different type of wooden box that was used for uh, shooting fishing lines out of. Same word. The English word for this thing would be a trencher. Now, this item here, you've maybe not seen one before, I'll show you what it does, and you'll maybe figure out the purpose. You can see this a thing like a goal post here, and there's a wooden base and a lid on it. Now, if you open up the lid, it's hinged at one end, it can only go that high, it doesn't go very far open, and there's this peg here at the front, which engages with a bar inside the box. Now I need to keep it under tension there and in order to keep it under tension I can put a rock on top and what you're left with there is not just a piece of still life for it does something and for this we need one rodent. Here's a mouse I've prepared earlier and uh, what they did was they put something in there to attract the mouse, maybe some oatmeal, something like that, maybe a nice piece of oily fish, like a bit of mackerel perhaps, and along comes the mouse, like so, makes his way inside until he gets to the wooden bar, and I can see from his tail sticking out there we've got a mouse, and sure enough he's pretty flat. end of the house. There's only two rooms in this house and uh, in that way it's fairly typical of a lot of the older Shetland houses. It was probably more common to have three rooms, a little closet room in the middle, but this one only has two. Uh, the bain end was the best room. Now its principal function was a bedroom, but I think we shouldn't view it as being the bedroom. It's the best room. Just as the, the butt end I guess one of its main uh, functions was the preparation of food and the eating of food. It certainly isn't a kitchen, it was a, a bit of a workshop area as well. And so, by the same token, the bain end here was a place where you might take, say, your more important visitors, say if the Laird's Factor was come to collect the rent, or if um, the Minister was coming by, or um, anybody really that you were wanting to treat in a bit more of a fancier uh, setting then they would come into the to the bain end and this is where your slightly um, finer things might be found maybe like ceramic ornaments and things like that you might find some of them in here um, and decorative things such as behind me here you can see that there's a print of a ship uh, and that's because this is the best room. Uh, also, 
um, there's a storage aspect to this room as well. The, the beds, and we'll talk about the beds in a moment, they're all of this box form. They have tall backs, sides, ends, and they have a roof as well. You can see, but you don't need to see. It's got a solid top on it. And uh, the beds in this room, besides sleeping, they can be used for storage as well. Uh, they should be here on display, but there's not, unfortunately. Is uh, on top, uh, various things are uh, put into storage when not in immediate use. For example, uh, spinning wheels, um, jumper boards, uh, and they were used in the same way as sock boards were used. Once the jumper had been laundered, then it was put onto this board to hinder it from stretching as it dried, otherwise you wouldn't get into it. Um, all those things, they're not used every day, they're used intermittently. And there's going to be limited storage space in the butt end, and the butt end storage tends to be for things that's used every single day or very frequently, so that infrequently and more cleanly items requiring storage come in here for storage. So that might be other things that would be on top of that bed, including a thing called the sweary, which was a box used for plying together two pieces of spun yarn into a, a thicker strand of yarn, so it's like a, a bobbin box, I suppose you could call it. Uh, wool cards, so that's for um, uh, teasing out the strands of wool preparatory to them being spun. All those things are stored on top of these beds. Um, so I think if we move on to the beds, I'd like to show you something more about them. Um, the reason that they have this boxed-in form is that uh, a house like this, as you can understand, it's going to be pretty cold and drafty, despite the fact that um, it's got nice peat fires, thatched roof, which is a good natural insulator for certain, but it's certainly drafty. Uh, behind me is the hearth, so there's a suction with the hearth all the time. The doors haven't got draft excluders around them, of course, so there's suck going through the house, so there's drafts, drafts and more drafts. Uh, and in winter time, uh, and winters of course were harder in really not necessarily just the 19th century, really up to maybe the 1960s there was more winters that uh, we would define a winter with deep snow and hard frosts. They did happen and water could freeze indoors so you really want your bed to be more than a place to sleep, it has to be a bit of a, a house inside the house, it's a, like a like a cabin. Uh, and they perhaps were even influenced from um, ship's beds, because men did take home uh, influences for things that they'd been and seen and done at sea. Uh, in fact, um, some of the, the chests stored under the bed here uh, are sea chests, Many chests were made for storage on land, but these characteristic ones with the, the tapering out base and the wide skirting, that's a classic sea chest design. That's something that somebody would take home when he's not at sea and um, store under the bed uh, if it's not actually one that permanently lives here. Um, so, going back to the bed again, um, it's got this cabin forum to stop um, drafts but it'll also stop any grime ending up amongst the bedding too, because uh, not only is the hearth here busily churning out smoke and therefore dust all the time, but you've also got above our heads here, you've got the underside of the roof, and you can see all that turf there, that's just a haven for uh, either dust in the form of the, the grass and the uh, the soil it's made from, um, dropping dust, but also and there's insects too, uh, and uh, that's got to make a bit of a mess of the bedclothes, so hence why it's all boxed in like this. Uh, and you can further reduce the, the elements by drawing the door shut. And I think it'd be quite nice to be in there. Now, a small room though it might be, 
uh, this is probably about the size of a modern day bedroom in which you would expect one bed. Uh, you've got box bed here, you've got uh, just in front of me a second box bed and to my right here, your left, there's an open bed and there's a cradle and that doesn't mean to say we've got four people in here. We might have, say, the married couple of the house might be in this bed but then you might have, say, three older children in that box bed and you might have uh, one uh, uh, child in there or maybe if they're small enough maybe two children in there head to foot uh, an infant in there and um, families of course were larger in the 19th century so in this house there's another box bed in the butt end and that was extremely common uh, some houses had two box beds in the butt end uh, and uh, families could have eight children typically but of course many had more some had ten some even had twelve but that's not to say that all would be in the house at one time because of course by the time that child number eight or child number ten arrived child number one and two they might then be old enough that they then left home uh, either to to take up married life themselves or maybe to take up work themselves so uh, you might be a, a living servant in a house if you're a, a, a lass, or you might be a, a merchant seaman if you're a boy. This is one of the two oot buildings that's adjoining the house. Uh, the most important animal for the, the family in Shetland was the cow, or the cattle, plural. Uh, traditional Shetland farmers weren't specialists, they were generalists. So every family had a few cattle, might only be three, some sheep, not very many, say 20 sheep, uh, maybe one or two swine, uh, some hens and perhaps also some ducks, some geese too. Uh, so they were generalists in that way. Uh, the most important animal, as I say, was the was the, the cattle. Animals were the cattle, and um, the reason that we're situated right next to the houses, and you can very easily go through that space. This middle space is what they call the trance, and that's the area between house, barn, and byre. So you can come in here at any time. Uh, the cattle live in here every night and the reason for that is that even during summertime when they could be outdoors uh, 24 hours uh, you didn't want to lose the, the benefit of the cow's muck. So if they're here indoors then it's going to be retained here because in summer they live out on the common grazing so if they're distributing muck all through the common grazings no human benefits for that at all so you want to get it in here uh, and they can't be roman ruined on the arable land because they eat the crops so they want to be in here um, and it also means that the cattle become very acquaint with being handled by people because they're being milked in the morning uh, when they're at the byre and then they're uh, uh, taken out depending on the time of year they might be tethered using one of these, this is a cow's tether, there's the stake, that's the bit that's knocked into the ground and that's the thing they call the swell, that's to stop the rope snarling up and twisting, this thing keeps the thing from getting the extra twist in it uh, they might be tethered out uh, on arable land but on this uh, during the morning or they might go out to the common grazings and then um, comes the afternoon or the evening they'd get another milking again before they come back in here again. Now winter time that's different. Winter they're not going to be out in the common grazings, they have to be in the township land at all times. Um, in a hard winter it's going to be tough on the cattle and they're always going to be getting the best farther going. They might get um, say uh, 
sheaves of oats which are part thrashed so there's still seed still on them uh, they'll get um, uh, potatoes uh, very often for the, the cattle they got the best fodder and they'd sometimes have warm water uh, poured over it as well uh, kale although kale was more commonly given to sheep um, uh, people used to cut uh, heather to give to the cattle as well for fodder uh, when it's still in, in leaf and dried um, and uh, this uh, task of tethering and moving cattle what they called flit and kai that was uh, like moving cattle uh, that was a, a task that took up a lot of time because uh, when they're on the township land and they're grazing the grass there uh, they can only graze so long until uh, they can't go beyond the length of their tether so then somebody's got to move them and um, that was uh, what people had, had in the coup sometimes they weren't even tethered they'd just be on a on a rope but not tethered and it, uh, somebody would be going through the, the ditches in the meadowland getting them to eat the grass there but never idle anybody doing that they would say be knitting a sock while they were doing it so they wouldn't be idle while they're at the task of heading the coup. Um, what we've also got here in the buyer besides the tethers, I'll just hang this one up again, is you've got these. And these are the divisions between the stalls. Your traditional Shetland cattle breed had horns, unlike most breeds you see today. Uh, so this is partly to stop them from injuring one another with their horns. Uh, it's partly also to stop them from getting fodder from the adjacent animal because uh, if it's distributed to the animals that need it most maybe more for a for a younger animal that was needing more fodder or if there's a sickly animal maybe it was getting different fodder you didn't want the adjacent uh, cow to be uh, nabbing the, the food belonging to the to the other one so that's the reason for these uh, and then if you look in the back here in the wall if I move to the side to get the light on it you can see these wooden pegs knocked into the stonework here. There's one up taller and one down behind me. I'll move to this side and you can see that one. The one down there. Uh, this is what uh, was called the Vegels. And uh, they were for tying the cow too, because obviously when she's here in the byre you don't want her to be rambling around. Um, so she's tied to this thing. And uh, the reason that there's two is that the, the cow, as I said, is in here for every night and in winter for most of the day. So there's a big accumulation of muck in here. That's the whole idea, or part of the idea, is the collection of the muck. And uh, to ensure it doesn't get very messy underfoot, uh, peat dust is added to this and of course there's going to be straw that gets trampled in as well so over the months floor level will rise above the flagstones that we're standing on here to there where my foot is then more then more again and um, such is the rise in the floor that quite often people needed to not flip the cow outdoors but actually need to flutter up the wall she sometimes had to move uphill uh, and it was certainly known to happen in um, smaller buyers older style buyers like this one is that by the end of the winter there could be so much muck accumulated in the buyer that their horns could be uh, catching and tearing in the in the roof turf here but uh, it would be or would have been improvident of them to put the muck out because it was a good idea, any any muck, if it had been put outdoors, would lose a lot of the nutrients because of rainwater and uh, all of those uh, minerals in both the muck and in the urine as well was all retained by continual adding of peat dust and straw so you had a very strong rich fertilizer which came springtime the, the buyer door, which is opposite me here, uh, that's the door that the cattle come in and out of, that's the external door to this building, 
uh, that's also used to muck out the buyer in springtime. Uh, and anything that isn't trapped in the peat dust in the cow's stall, the busy as it was called, or doesn't end up going out the door come springtime, ends up going down the channel, which is this way here. That was called uh, a runnock, and a runnock was um, a buyer drain. And you can see it's stepped down from the main floor of the buyer here and gets progressively deeper the further out you go. And that's really for any liquid manure that doesn't get caught in the in the process here. It can run out there, so um, that's the, the purpose of that. Uh, an inevitable thing that all children ask, and I think it's probably just as well to put it put it on our film here because uh, bairns love it. It's the inevitable question: Where did they go to the toilet? I don't know. Maybe it just appeals to every child. Where did they go to the toilet? Well, this is where they went to the toilet <laughs> because uh, not only. Um, uh, cattle, but humans too. All you did was just, you know, put your back to the to the wall here and squat down and drop there. And uh, there's plenty straw for toilet paper, so that's what they did. So, all bairns watching, you can try this at home if you've got a buyer. This part of the, the Croft Museum is the barn. That's one of the two oot buildings attached to the house. Uh, a barn was a, a workshop space as well as a, as a store area. Uh, this is where the agricultural tools were kept. In the, the middle of the 19th century or the third quarter of the 19th century, the tools were fairly basic. Um, there wasn't a, really very many that were uh, factory made or locally made. There wasn't even the, all that many that were um, for draft animals in some places. A lot of the cultivation in the 19th century was done just by by spade power alone and uh, not every family had a plough so uh, a lot of the things kept in here were fairly small so hence as a store area for a farm. To us it doesn't seem very big but it answered to the needs of the Shetlanders. Uh, and I mentioned also workshop area. Uh, one piece of evidence of that is right at my side here. There's a carpenter's lathe. Uh, it's a super example here. It's very rare. It's the only one left in Shetland that's completely locally made. There's no factory made element to this at all. It's all made for heavy driftwood. You can see this big heavy flywheel here. Nicely made with this iron plates attaching it together. Uh, the headstocks here is made of uh, hardwood uh, and uh, all of it is made of timber. There's no metal to it other than the, the vital bits, the spindle and the shaft here that has to be. Uh, the driving belt is missing but it's not in that bad condition. Uh, not every barn would have this in it. This is only going to be in the home of somebody that has uh, a chap that's uh, skilled in woodwork, uh, but there were jobs for turning, uh, might be say like um, making spinning wheels needed a lot of turned components, uh, handles for things like maybe say grain sickles, things like that, they had turned handles on them often, so that was tasks that um, a woodworker would have. So the, unlike most of the things in this uh, craft museum, this might have been used for things beyond the family themselves. A neighbour might have come to get a job done by the person here. Maybe not even necessarily for money, it would have been in return for other goods and services and favours given. So it was, um, if not a moneyless society, it was a society that didn't depend so much entirely on money as we do. Now I mentioned about uh, workshop area. This hatch that's open here at the moment, um, this is 
uh, one part of the main workshop use of this bit of the building. What happened was that uh, in the, the winter time, once the harvest had happened and the, the crops were uh, stacked here in the yard, then um, they needed to be taken in here to be thrashed. So this hatch was opened, this hatch was called the glig, and you open the glig, somebody's out there and they toss in sheaves to another person in here and they are passing them in and once they've got so many in here then they're ready to be thrashed and that's where this item comes in. This is the flail and the flail consists of uh, what was called the stong and the supel, it's the supely band and this is used to break the, the seeds of the sheaf of grain and usually it was a two-man job and uh, people would stand opposite one another and this wooden floor here was ideal for that because it was nice and flat. Uh, the outer part of the floor and the inner bit here is made of flagstones but this bit here in the middle is wooden and um, the grain is laid on the floor there, two sheaves going one way with the cut ends outermost, two there with the cut ends outermost, so you've got four sheaves with the seeds all overlapping in the middle and uh, you might need to spread them out so you get this bit and you pull them out that way and push them out that way, same there, same there, so you've got them spread out as much as you can. Then you turn it around again and you, with this bit here, you give it a thump like that and um, two are working. So you have to be in total tandem here, in symbiosis, because uh, you might end up braining your opponent. So one is up like this while the other one is doing, and then the other one is doing when the other one is up. And uh, you're diagonally opposite one another, so I'm, I'm standing here, beating there, and he's standing there, beating there. Um, so that's the, the way that the flail worked. And uh, once you've done that, and you've you've broken it all up, then you're left with straw and grain. And the straw, it could be used for anything of course, it uh, could be used for basketry, making ropes, thatching, it might end up its life as a mattress, it might end up its life as, as a horse's breakfast. But the grain, uh, it's important too, more important. Um, the first thing you've got to do is to sweep it all up and to put it in a, in a barrel or a bag and then as soon as you can you've got to winnow it because you've got a mixture of um, the, the, the chaff and the, the, the seeds and, the, and especially the chaff it's going to draw damp so you want to get rid of that as quick as you can. You can do it outdoors but you can do it indoors too if it's windy enough. Uh, if it's a really windy day, you could do it on this floor. You'd open the barn door there, and you'd open the outside door, and the glig is open, so you've got suction going right through, or draft going right through. And uh, one or two people would work here, lifting up this combined mass of grain and chaff, and just let it run through their fingers, and the chaff will blow off to one side and the grain falls down in a pile and you work your way through the, the, the barrel full or the bag full like that until you've got rid of all that chaff and you've got nice grain, just grain and um, at that point you can put it into storage in a barrel but again you don't want that to draw damp it's going to be less likely to draw damp when it's been winnowed which is the name of that process, but it's still going to draw damp. Um, so you really want to get cracking on and get it dried next. So for that process we go to the other end of the barn. At the other end of the barn here is this structure here that from outdoors looks something like a broch, like an Iron Age castle. Um, and this is a grain kiln because Although you've removed the chaff for the grain, you still kind of grind it without drying it because it'll clog up 
mill stones or they'll clog up quarn stones and you need to to get that moisture out of it so it's nice and dry and this is where that process is done. Um, this was very general, completely common and regular in the the very southern tip of Shetland but as Shetland goes as a whole this is very atypical uh, probably for 80% of Shetland a different type of structure was used it was a small um, oblong stone construction in the corner of a barn um, with wooden laths on top of it and it had a little flue and you built the grain on top of that thing and uh, any smoke coming out of it you just had to open the glick and open the barn door and the smoke by the draw of the air would go to either of the two uh, exits depending on the wind direction. But here in Dundrosnes where the agricultural land was or is better and higher grain yields meant that uh, this circular and bigger type of grain kiln had developed long ago in the Middle Ages, so it is a very venerable lineage um, and uh, this is the type of kiln that was used. How it operated was that um, this little box here at the side, this is part of it, um, this is the, the gable of the, the barn. The kiln is a round structure on the outside uh, and there's two um, apertures in it. One is the big bit here that we can see and one is through this little box in here. There's a maybe a sort of a one foot by two or a two and a half foot by two uh, hole at the bottom of this wall right down at the foot and it goes in through the thickness of the gable. A peat fire was placed in this bit and the big broad lintel was to stop it flaring up because uh, it, could, it could burn the house down or burn the barn down um, and also you didn't want a fierce fire for a kiln, you wanted a, a prolonged steady fire uh, so the idea was to to get your fire going and to keep it going but not ablaze and having the fire far away from the kiln meant you're not going to endanger setting fire to the kiln or these wooden laths that lie on top of the kiln and uh, by keeping that going you can have the fire uh, drawn in or the heat drawn in I should say not the fire drawn in through under the laths what we call the rammocks and uh, the, the heat rises up through the rammocks and then there's a layer of straw and then the grain is piled on top and as the, the hours go on and it took a long time, it might take you all day the, the heat comes through the straw through the, the grain which begins by steaming that's the moisture coming off it and then later it starts to harden up and dry properly and uh, from time to time, and this is another one of the many advantages of having the house attached to the outbuildings. You don't have to be in here all day long. You can be in the house doing something else. But you can't abandon your post, so you have to come through now and again, attend to the fire, and also now and again take some seeds from here, bite them. And uh, when you've discerned that they're hard enough, you can stop drying and you can rake it out. There's a wooden rake that was used to haul it out and it's ready for grinding. Uh, and to increase the suction also um, a straw winnowing mat can be hung over the face here to increase the, uh, the suction if there's not enough um, draft. No problem today though, I can feel the wind blowing through it. Now, talking about grinding, we can move to the other end here. When grain was ready to be made into meal, then this is one of the two apparatus that was used. If you 
we're going to prepare a small amount for immediate use. This was your tool. This is the quern. Now, it operates by having a lower stone and an upper one, and the handle here, of course, and uh, the dried grain, you work it in your hand like that, just keeping a steady flow, and you feed it into the eye of the stone here, and you're rotating it like that, and uh, you, depending on whether you're requiring a finer flour or a rougher meal, you can adjust it. So this peg here can rotate. Now, you can maybe see, maybe not, that there's a wooden bar under the quern here, and right underneath it, there's a wooden peg. Now by twisting this wooden peg here, you're ultimately going to, there we go, yeah, there we go. You're raising or lowering uh, another wooden peg underneath. So rotate this, shorten string, raises bar that goes in and out, raises peg or lowers peg that ultimately balances this top stone. And all that complicated sounding rigmarole is actually quite simple and it means that you can make the stone rotation easily done or <laughs> very difficult to do and that of course determines how rough your grain is going to be and this is, uh, this is what they call the, the overstein this is what they call the luder all the parts here of course had local names now this was used if you didn't have very much grain to process but ideally you're going to do it in winter time when streams are flowing there's maybe even say snow being thawing so there's lots of water in the burns and that's when water mills operate and there you're going to process a lot all at one time and you don't need to use this uh, and in that case you're going to have more meal to to store, to put away in the butt end in the gurnal. Now, there's a different way that grain could be processed too, and that involves this thing. This is called uh, a knocking stain. The older pronunciation was knocking stain, and the uh, knocking stain was, I suppose, you could define it as a pot quern. It wasn't for um, converting grain seeds into flour, it's for de-husking them, de-husking the grains of barley so that you could boil the barley whole. So say for example if you're making broth maybe with, um, I don't know, say um, a sheep's head and some kale, uh, that's a typical one, and you might want some whole barley for making that broth with. How it was used was uh, Typically somebody would sit on a stool like that, one of these little stools that in Shetland was called a creepy. And somebody sat on the creepy and it's a thing that usually involved two people. One sits opposite me and uh, that person over there, they have a, a basket of barley and they put some barley in the stone here and they also have a kettle of boiling water. Yet another reason of how it's so handy having the house adjacent to all the outbuildings. You don't have to go very far to get a kettle of boiling water. And somebody puts uh, barley into the stone here and the person puts some hot water on it. And then I then go like this and I start knocking the barley using this device, this is what's called a mel. So you beat the barley with the mel, and as time goes on, after a few minutes, maybe a couple of minutes, the other person will maybe indicate to stop beating this thing. So you lift out the mel like that, and the person over there will uh, feel the seeds, see if uh, they're uh, beginning to 
part company with the husks or not. Uh, if it's getting too messy and the seeds are coming out the side of the stone, that means that uh, she or he needs to add more water to it to get the the mass of seeds to coagulate together again as they should be, because otherwise they fly all over the place and that process continues until the person there can see that uh, the separating process has happened. Um, they've also got to, from time to time, the person opposite me has to scoop the seeds back in again. Sometimes people platter the a straw collar to lay around the side if they were doing it on their own, didn't have somebody to do that, so you'd have that mechanism to stop things from coming out the side. But at any rate, once the thing has um, done its dehusking, then the the damp mass is put onto a, a sheepskin tray, a thing called a wecht, and a wecht was um, uh, like a I suppose like a looks like a drum skin. I suppose like a drum skin on a on a wooden frame, and this was spread out flat, typically put on top of the of the one of the beds in the house, one of these box beds where it's going to get lots of warm air, and once it's nice and dry, then somebody can take it and take it outdoors and shake it to blow off all that husks off it, and uh, goes through a sieve as well to sieve out any bits of grit because there's going to be picking up sandstone grit from the stone as well, you don't want that in your soup. So that's how the knocking stain and the mill was used to prepare what they called knocket corn. So life went on through the centuries through the Middle Ages into the early modern period, I wouldn't say unchanged, but certainly very little changing. But things started to move pretty briskly in the 18th century. And this was because, of course, of outside forces. Um, a commercial fishery was being built up in Shetland, and most districts of Shetland, maybe even the majority families in Shetland, were involved in this fisheries to some extent or other. And as the economy started to become more vigorous, so also imported ideas as well as imported goods made their way into the Shetland home. So you had, uh, to begin with, very basic things such as glass, because Shetlanders couldn't make their own glass, of course, so you had things like glass windows. You can't imagine an era when houses didn't have glass windows, but that happened for the common people uh, as recently as the 18th century. Um, there might be things like, say, uh, imported ceramics. People used to use wooden bowls and even wooden communal eating uh, trenchers, a big oblong trencher they ate from, uh, and say the ceramic uh, uh, tableware. And all that came in in the 18th century. And as time went on through the 19th century, as imports increased and uh, ideas imported ideas became more prevalent, people's expectations changed. They gradually wanted to emulate the way of life of their uh, peers elsewhere in Britain. So people were aware of, in the way that people always want to uh, better the lives of themselves and their families, they wanted to perhaps get a, a clock for the mantelpiece or to get um, a cast iron teapot, or indeed for that matter to be able to buy tea full stop. Uh, all these things are imported ideas or goods. And this had a gradual effect in the same way as a, as a glacier can wear down a mountain range if you give it enough time. So too did the character of the traditional Shetland home begin to change in the 19th century. Uh, so as the decades rolled on in the 19th century, there were more and more things that uh, you could almost say ate away at the indigenous character of the Shetland home and it started to develop in a, in a different way. Uh, if we were able to shoot back into the 19th century and compare a Shetland home with one in, say, Orkney, uh, um, say, Northern Ireland or maybe in the Hebrides or the Highlands, 
we would see a degree of convergence as a lot of these things were being introduced into um, other cultures, not maybe the same as Shetland, but certainly comparable with Shetland. Um, now, I'm going to hurtle on through many decades now. Uh, by the 20th century, the process of change was speeding up all the time, and a lot of the elements of what we would now consider as being classic characteristics of the traditional Shetland home were beginning to disappear. Uh, we were starting to get houses we uh, upstairs in them, a two-level house, houses with porches on them, houses with tar roofs, not straw roofs, houses with wooden floors, houses with iron stoves, not open fires. All these things were beginning to change and uh, the number of factory-made items in the home began to burgeon in every possible way. It could be steel um, baking trays or it might be um, leather shoes which are factory made or it might be ceramic ornaments or paraffin lamps or the paraffin that was in the lamp for that matter uh, anything and everything cutlery uh, factory made garments all sorts of things and um, it meant that when Shetlanders left the islands as they did in the late 19th and early 20th centuries if they were ever to have come back to Shetland again, it was inevitable that they would see a fair degree of change in their lifetime. Change speeds up, that's the nature of change. And um, in 1960 there was a visiting deputation of expatriate Shetlanders who came for a big uh, festival here called the Hem Fairing. And the Hem Fairing was for islanders who had either left themselves as emigrants or their parents or even their antecedents farther back had left and they came back to Shetland again in 1960 having left maybe say in 1920 and the amount of change was far more palpable to them as the expatriate Shetlanders than for the islanders at home because the islanders at home they'd continued to live where they were and prove their way of life and um, we weren't perhaps so aware of the fact that things were falling off the conveyor belt of history in a way that these expatriates were uh, sensitive to it. So what they did uh, a few years later, not many years later, uh, primarily the, the New Zealand contingent of expatriates, they began to uh, uh, agitate in a positive way, I think that word can be used pejoratively, agitate in a positive way um, that a, a traditional old style um, Shetland home and outbuildings be preserved for the future uh, and it was a home that they might have known in the Shetland that they left or that their parents had known about and um, it seems quite incredible now that it took hold in a way that it did because in Shetland in the 1980s the economy was awash with money because of the fact that there had been an oil era and there was lots of money in the economy and lots of things were happening but this was the, uh, the late 1960s by the time that this um, campaign had gathered traction long before the oil era they didn't know there was going to be an oil era and the the, the Shetland County Council was not exactly a wash with money, but they were receptive. They they wanted to preserve something of Shetland's past. I think maybe something that's maybe different to the Shetland of the 1960s than nowadays is that there had been, I suppose, a fairly cohesive Shetland society up to that point and people kind of more or less all came from a common background uh, a common rural background and people in the society as a whole felt that it was there in inverted commas history in a way that you couldn't maybe say today there's a more of a, a disparate uh, heterogeneous nature to the society new and at any rate um, a house was identified or a, or a steading I should say because it's more than just a house 
and this one here, which is called Suthvo, was uh, identified and was renovated. And the renovation took place in 1970-71 and it opened in 1971. Um, the house itself and the buildings had been built about maybe 1830s, but in the, the renovation as you see it today, it would be more correct to say it resembles a house of perhaps maybe about 1870. And uh, that was the, I suppose, the, the guiding vision because the nature of nostalgia is that um, nostalgia is the way of life that more or less my grandparents would have known. Anything further back than that, is, there's no going to be really the, the hook into it of nostalgia and anything more recent is no maybe going to have the same um, heritage oomph. Now, it's interesting now, of course, that 50 years has moved on since, 60 years has moved on since those hemfarers were here, and um, no living person knew can say that their grandparents lived in a house like this. So that's been a, an unintended benefit in the renovation, is that it's set in a time more very effectively, something that's now impossibly far back in time. Now, hindsight's a great thing. Uh, and I'm now going to employ some hindsight. Um, it's clear to us now that uh, the initiative to save a house and out houses was a. <laughs> it's clear to us now that the initiative to save a house and out houses was a fantastic idea. It was a great idea. If it hadn't been done then in the in the late 1960s to open in 1971, it would probably never have been done. And it could now not be done because there are no buildings like this left in Shetland anymore.